my name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I am the lab director at Game Changer Chicago Design Lab at the University of Chicago. And I am here to talk to you about health and games for Chicago's youth. And I'll primarily talk about one project, which is Bystander. This is our uh, program, our game uh, trying to prevent sexual assault and sexual violence um, in uh, Chicago high schools. So as I mentioned, I am at Game Changer Chicago. We're actually a part of a larger research institution known as CI3. And the goal of CI3 is to imagine, we want to imagine a world where young people have agency over their own bodies, their own choices, their own health and their own future. And so we're constantly looking at what we call social determinants of health, which means it's not just about reproductive health or health care, like the health care system. We're also looking at things like education. We're looking at poverty. We're looking at um, other, other ways that we can engage the young people and meet them where they're at. And so my lab specifically focuses on games. And so before I start talking about my project, I need to go through the question of, why games? Because people are always confused about, you just created a game about sexual violence, prevent, like how do you, what does that even mean? Why would you do that? And I'm like, aha, that's a great question. So let's talk about that really quickly. So we work with high school students on the south and west sides of Chicago, so they're primarily African American and Latinx. So our youth are between the ages of 13 and 18 in my lab, though we have a wider range. This is an old statistic. This is coming from, I believe, 2012-ish. Uh, and so this is from the Pew Research Institute. 97% of youth at that time played games. I'm going to assume that number is larger. 97% of ma uh, women, uh, girls, play games. 99% of boys played games. These are the different areas in which they play games. Mobile is popular, but consoles are still reigning supreme. Again, this is for the US, I so just want to make that clear, because if you go into places like China or India or South Korea, these numbers are going to be a little different. But for the US, this is where our youth are at. Fun statistic, Call of Duty, Black Ops. This is a game where players, if you tally up how much time they've spent in this game, they have spent a collective of 470,000 years of time in this game. That's a lot of time, right? Grand Theft Auto V is one of the highest grossing uh, selling games of all times. It hit $1 billion uh, in three days. So it hit 16.5 million sales in three days. So this is why we're focused on games. Many of our young people are playing games. And so we want to first meet them where they're at. Right? Meet them in a medium where they're at. Because we're nerds and I work at a university, we also talk about the theory behind game. We do applied work, but we also talk about theory. So we're looking at uh, game theorists such as Ian Bogos or um, Jasper Jules or, um, oh, what? I'm blanking on his name, but um, he is working at uh, Arizona State University, uh, James Paul Gee. So we're always reading the theorists to kind of give us a basis of why we do what we do. And so we talk about the four pillars of what games are really good at doing. Games are really good at providing players agency, right? Think of a game, and anytime you're playing a game, the game is not gonna continue without your input, right? So you make those choices. You continue to play or you can choose not to play, right? It's also a place where you can try and, and fail Right? So it's trial and error. You can try different strategies to see what works. Right? It is a safe place for failure. It creates what's known as a magic circle. You step in this circle, you make some decisions, things probably go poorly or really well, whatever, but there's no ramifications once you step out that magic circle. Right? So it's a really great space for failing. That's not like school right? or the government or our justice system, but games provide this place to do that. It's also really good at depicting systems, right? You can think of something very like abstract, like think of the Big Bang, and you can actually model that in a game and have players construct universes and galaxies, right? You can have people construct nanobots and go into the human body and understand things at a microscopic scale. You can, it's very hard to get people to wrap their heads around those things, but you can do that very easily in a game. So this is why we do what it is that we do, 
And now I hope that makes sense to you before I talk about Bystander. Cool. So Bystander is a project that we started, I believe, in 2015-ish. Um, and so this was coming from the idea of the young people that come and work in our lab. We have fellows. Um, they're high school fellows. And they designed their own game called Lucidity, and it was talking about sexual violence in a home. And so after the young people designed this game, it was, you know, it was, it was a very short period of time. They don't know how to program. They don't really do art, but they're working together with us in the lab to try and create an experience. And so what we realized was, oh, young people are really, they're talking a lot about sex and sexual harassment and sexual violence. And so how can we in our research lab also talk to them about these topics, right? We have, back, we have researchers, public health researchers working with us, right? So we have access to data. We're at the University of Chicago. We have access, we have the technology. We could probably do this, right? Um, me and my team, we are professional game designers. We do not have degrees in public health, but we do care strongly about games. We do believe that games have a persuasive, they're not more persuasive than any other medium, like a book or a television show, but we do believe that they have a persuasive power to them, right? And so we have to think about the metaphor of the games, and if we work with public health researchers, we can create an intervention that can speak to the young people. So bystander is coming from a bystander approach where we're taking, where we're thinking about sexual violence and making it a community issue where everyone, regardless of gender, regardless of race or as, uh, social economic status, will help prevent sexual violence within their community. We want to make sure that we are discouraging victim blaming, right? So that whole thing of, oh, well, this person was drinking too much or this person was wearing a short skirt. That's victim blaming. We are not trying to create a, a game or an experience that would speak to that. And again, we want to give responsibility to both men and women. And because we have access to this data and this, um, and this research, we broke it down into four major scenarios. But I'll only show two of them here because I think these are the ones that are not talked about enough. But I'll give you a high level overview. We have four modules. The first module is about uh, Title IX, which is gender-based discrimination in, in um, educational settings. Um, so we focused again on the high school setting. Um, so we talk about sexual harassment there. So what does sexual harassment mean? How is that different from uh, sexual uh, assault? Right? What are, what, are the, what are the lines between that? The second one is focused on alcohol, right? of when people are drinking too much and what happens, can you look out for your friend if they've been drinking and what do you do? How do you intervene safely? The two scenarios that I'll show you here, and I actually have a little demo if we're interested in actually um, playing that, if I have some time, is this one here, which is male on male sexual assault. Many people do not believe that men can be sexually assaulted. It can happen, right? And we wanna make it a point for our young people to understand that. Um, and so we had to really think carefully, carefully about how we constructed this, right? We don't want people to play as the person who was assaulted, right? Because many people, that would require maybe people to disclose what happened to them. It might be triggering, right? We want them to be in a place where they can intervene. And so you always play as the friend who is intervening, um, not necessarily intervening or talking to a person who has gone through this, um, this situation. So here, as you've seen this GIF, it's been playing a couple times here. Um, you're walking down the street with your friend, and he is asking you a series of questions. He doesn't know the answers to them. You don't know the answers to them. But you do have access to technology. You have access to your phone. And so the way the game takes place is actually you're scrolling through the menus, and you're trying to find that information. And you're trying to answer his question before you get to school. So as you continue to answer the questions, this box um, kind of, uh, appears to be the school, and then once you reach your destination, he tells you what he wants to do about the situation. He's still not sure about it just yet, but he is happy that you have provided him with the information that you need. The second scenario um, is partner on partner sexual assault. Okay? Um, again, many people think that once you're in a relationship, uh, if you have sex once, then you, know, you are obligated to have sex again. That, again, is not true. We want to make sure our young people understand this. And so here a friend discloses what happened on her date 
um, and he gave him, a, and she gave, her partner gave her a bracelet, and so she felt obligated, and again, not true, right? So you, as the friend, are having these conversations with her. There's, she asks, she's spouting these rape myths, and you are supposed to dispel said rape myths. In this scenario, you have a bunch of different options. One option is correct. Two options are incorrect, right? Again, this is a safe place for failure. So we do encourage people to understand, uh, explore how to respond, but also understand what's the correct response and what's not the correct response. We also do have an option to keep listening because she is divulging a lot of information and you might not actually know what to do. Again, we want to make sure our young people have a space to just sit back, take it in, and listen. Right? And that's an option. That is a mechanic that we wanted, and that's something that they can do. Um, so those are our two scenarios that we have, uh, uh, four scenarios that we have. But I think what's really critical about this game in particular is that we actually worked with young people to design this game. Our, our young high school fellows were a part of the script writing process. They told us when things didn't make sense. They're actually the people who are the actors and the game characters. The way that we did this was we had young people pose and take pictures, and we created this comic book-like aesthetic, again, based off of what they thought would be interesting and speak to them and their peers. Right? So we used the participatory design method um, to really engage them, because this is not for us, this is for young people. And how can we design something for young people when we're not young anymore, right? When I, I was born in the 90s, I was raised in the 90s, which was a great time, I am now officially old. And I'm okay with that, right? The young people are like, ah, uh, no, change this, change that. No one would say that anymore. Fine, yes, you're, you're probably right. I haven't been in high school for like 10 years. Yes, right? And so again, we, we asked them, how do they feel? How are you, how are you thinking about this? If, if someone told you this, how would you, how, how, what will your facial expressions be like, right? And we use those in the game. And so we took video footage of people acting and, and pretending to have conversations. So this is, this is uh, if I played the audio, our audiovisual director was saying, well, how, if your friend told you a joke, what would you do, right? So that's why she laughed. If someone told you that if you're not, if you're feeling hesitant, what would you do? If you were feeling sad, what would you do? Show, show her the bracelet so we can show how this would look, how this would feel. So we're always engaging our young people, and I think that's one of the key things that I, makes, I, I just feel technology really relevant. If you include the people that you're designing this for, right, and actually design with, right, you don't want to dictate to people, this is for them, include them at the table. Um, so, the last couple things that I'll say, where we're at in the process, we have designed it. It exists. You can play it. There are a couple of bugs, but that's technology. Whatever. <laughs> um, but we're, we have re, we had did our, our literature reviews, right? We have our background research. We worked with game designers. We worked with youth and young people. And what we did was we now have actually finished a randomized control trial where we have had this game alongside our curriculum, and we have played this um, with over 1,000 Chicago public school students. And so we have, we've collected data. Some public health researcher is cleaning and analyzing that data. I don't know. They'll figure it out. And they will let me know if <laughs> this is doing the thing that we want it to do. And so far from our play test sessions, we've, it's actually sparking a lot of interesting conversation. So right now I can speculate it's doing exactly what we want it to do. What we're hoping is that the disclosures in school will go up, right? Because people now have a language to talk about what's happening, right? And that's the first step. So we can then start moving into deeper, more complex conversations about sexual violence, sexual assault. But what we're also trying to do is scale it, right? We are, we are researchers, we're game designers. We're focused on the product, we're focused on the research and, and our young people. And then it's like, oh my gosh, but there's like millions of people out there who could be playing this, right? And so now it's like, I turn it all to you to say like, how can, like, how can this be scaled? How can we think about you know, market research? How can we contain this in either a website or something? Because now we're like, oh no, we have this cool thing, what, what comes next, right? 
So that's all I have for you. That's, I'm at a 15 minute mark, but I do have a demo. Demo, excellent. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch it up, but maybe if you have any questions while I switch things up, just go ahead and ask them. Is it multiplayer or just single player? So right now this game is single player. Um, we have talked about how to actually devise this in a school-based environment. So one, because this is a very like hot button topic, right? We want to make sure we kind of sim structure the overall experience, right? We want this to be in the hands of a trained facilitator who can guide these conversations. Um, and also, we want people to experience this on their own and then bring their own thoughts and feelings to the group. So single player right now, um, to be discussed in a larger kind of curricular setting. Just a quick question. How are you planning on enticing high school students to play this? Is it going to be mandatory in the CPS system? Like, would that be your I ideal way to implement this? Or more so voluntarily opt in mm -hmm. for students? Yeah. So there are two ways to um, kind of think of this. Um, so this, uh, sex, sex ed is mandated in all Illinois uh, public schools. Um, so this is a piece that can be put in there. We have, to tell, we have to talk about sexual harassment, STIs, teen pregnancy. So we view this as a place where it just adds to what is already necessary and kind of takes some of the burden off of what uh, teachers already have to do. Um, so we would like this to be in schools. However, we're still kind of trying to think about ways where, again, we want this to be in a structured environment where people can have this conversation, but we do want to make it open and available for the public to play. And so this kind of second piece of letting it be just open and just people playing it, having opinions, we want that, but also we don't want it to kind of take the conversation where like sexual violence is already going, like spiraling out of control in the way that people are thinking about it. And we are really, in, we want to be intentional about our impact, and we would much rather prefer not to have a negative impact on that conversation, and so we're kind of like hesitant because we don't know how that would go. You mentioned how like you try to have the game from different like gender perspectives and race perspectives and whatever, but does it also include like queer perspective? Uh, so we have not included a queer perspective uh, just yet. Well, actually, let me take that back. There is a queer perspective. So this is um, on the male-on-male -male sexual uh, ass assault um, mini, mini game, I'll call it, the scenario, um, where this young man was assaulted by another young man. However, we don't talk about necessarily like gender orientations. I think he mentions very briefly like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter your sexual orientation, but it's not really specific to the LGBTQ community. Um, I will say we are always like thinking, like trying to do some future thinking of like, well, what would the next version of this look like? This is just to kind of build the ground level for language, but now we have to really start thinking about the specifics in terms of culture, sexual orientation, all these things. So that's very important for us. I think this is amazing and really awesome. That's not a question. But my question is, um, I wonder if you could tell us about the ideation of of it ah. and the funding and yeah. how it was how it was chosen to work specifically on this issue and how it was paid for mm -hmm. we this game has been funded by a couple of different entities um, we are part of the hive learning network um, so this is a organization with a bunch of youth serving organizations connected together um, and so it's it has a lot of funding done through, it used to be MacArthur Foundation, then it used to be Mozilla, and so the Chicago Community Trust funds us. So we got initial funding from that pool, um, and then to do our research, um, I can't remember the funding, but it was federal funding, I can't remember if it's NIH or NSF. So this is uh, so National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. Um, so this is the, the benefit of working at an academic institution working with people who are public health researchers, who are medical doctors, who understand that funding cycle. I have not experienced grant funding in my life. I'm just a humble game designer, and so that's how it was funded. Um, the development process is very interesting. Game designers work interdisciplinary, disciplinarily, right? There are programmers, artists, sound designers, et cetera. Researchers work multidisciplinarily, right? There are clinical psychologists, pu public health professionals, medical doctors are kind of used to working with one another. And then chaos ensues 
when two groups of people who have never worked with each other try to work with each other. And then you can take a simple phrase like, it doesn't work, and that just means so many different things. The game developers are like, oh my gosh, is there a bug? Should we fix this bug? Can you get through the game? Oh, you can? What's the issue? That's not a problem. The researchers are like, this game might not actually change anyone's attitudes or behavior. I don't care if they're having fun or they can get through the experience. What are, are, their learn are they taking away the learning objectives? Right? It's after five years that I'm now able to like deduce, like, oh, we're actually talking about two different things. Oh, I see. So <laughs> the, this, this game was uh, developed in about a year and a half, and a lot of it was just trying to figure out what the heck you're even talking about. Is a playtest session the same thing as research evaluation? It's not the same thing, right? Because one requires you to go through an, an internal review board to make sure that, the, that when you do research that it's ethical, right? Think of the, Tus uh, the, the Tuskegee experiments, right? We don't want that to happen again. Go to the IRB. Play, we're just wanting to see, like, is it working? Are you kind of just, you know, does the user interface make sense? That's all we care about in a playtest session, right? So a lot of that was happening and a lot of confusion there. But the way that the iterations happened was uh, the researchers would come up with the learning objectives. We would go back, design a small thing, very like rapid prototyping. The, ex the, when you saw the two gentlemen walking down the street, I actually used like penguins like gifts of penguins walking down the street and just like a cutout of like a phone just to get the experience going. This goes back to interdisciplinary work. Researchers are like, what is this? Why are they penguins? And I'm like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the first iteration. Like it's functional, you can play it. Like this is how it's gonna work. And so that took some time, <laughs> right? Right, so I could try and play test it with young people who were also confused why they were penguins, right? And I'm just like, oh, I don't, yeah, right? But just making sure that it worked while our art director was getting the stuff to me. I tell you, once I put everything in there, everyone was like, oh, this makes so much sense. This is so great. I'm like, oh my God. It took like two months of my life of just like defending my choice of penguins. Hi. Um so you already kind of touched upon the dynamics between, um, you know, the researcher side, um, the, the game development side. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, like, the team itself? Like, you know, how many of them are coming from the game development side? Mm -hmm. How many of them are coming from research side? Um, and also, if they're from research side, then, like, what kind of, you know, research, like, what, what kind of fields and domains are involved mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Thank you. Yeah. So, for instance, my background is in information science and technology. I have a minor in security risk and analysis. I thought I'd be that cool, like, hacksaw chick working for the federal government. And then I was like, no, why not make games? Um, so that's my background. My pro a programmer, traditional game developer, went to Columbia College. We have, you know, our AV specialists who worked on this coming from videography, cinematography. So it's more of a traditional kind of game development team. And even the same thing from our research team. Many of them are working, they have masters in public health. We had uh, like a, P, a person with a PhD in clinical, clinical and behavioral psychology working with us. Um, the founder of the organization is Dr. Melissa Gilliam. She is a uh, medical doctor in the ob department. Um, and she's still a practicing medical doctor. And the entire reason why she created this center was because she saw a lot of young girls with repeat pregnancies. Um, and the other co-founder of this is actually Professor uh, Dr. Patrick Jagoda, who's a new media specialist. So we are coming from all these different backgrounds. Um, and so we had an even split of researchers and game designers working on the, on the project. Um, and, we, and by the time we started working on this project, actually both of these individual researchers and game designers have worked on many projects before. So they're actually all used to working with each other. So I'm pretty sure like any time people were frustrated with one another, they'd go back to their groups and like complain about the other group. Like that's what was happening. Um, but that's the general makeup of it, yeah. I love the project, and it reminds me a lot about some recent games, such as Detroit Become Human, oh, where no. the player has to make choices that can dictate the outcome. You mentioned that they are allowed to make the wrong choice in a safe environment. How are they informed in the game, and what consequences does the player have for making the wrong choices? That's a great question. I had that reaction because I just finished 
like beasting through Detroit become human. And I have a lot of opinions about Quantic Dream and David Cage. Ask me about that later. He continues to fail me, and yet I just want so much from him. Putting that on a shelf. Choice in games. So the, I think oh, the way that we handle uh, choice in making wrong, uh, the incorrect decision in the game is that we actually throughout this entire experience, there is a teacher facilitator character. We gave him the title of Virgil because our AV specialist was also a philosophy major. And he loved Dante's Inferno. I'm just like, what is going on? These are not the nine circles of hell, but fine, we will name him Virgil. And so we have Virgil, and he is actually going around t telling people what these different uh, terms are. And so if you make an incorrect choice, in the partner scenario, you actually can make three incorrect choices. Um, you can see the response of the, of the girl. She seems really dis disheartened about what you just said, but it'll move on because it's, it's fine. As long as you, there are 10 questions. If you get through seven of the questions correctly, you're fine. If you make four incorrect choices, then Vir you'll hear Virgil's voice, which you've seen him earlier in the game, come in and he'll talk about how um, you know, this is incorrect. You should really think through about how you respond to how, uh, this person. Um, and then we'll kind of go over the things that you're supposed to do in this scenario. So that's kind of how we handle it. But it's, it's very different from something like Detroit Become Human, where you can actually see the, like, the ramifications of your choice. And then it kind of connects with all of the other game choices where we don't spiral like that. Okay, you give the example with Virgil and, and he tells the player what they did wrong. Do they get the chance to redo it over or does it keep pushing yes. forward? It'll, it'll give, you'll have to re, retry the entire experience, yeah. But they, all the modules are very short, so we don't, of course, we, as game, gamers and game designers, we kind of understand what works and what doesn't work in terms of games, and so we don't want to drag on the experience. Also, this is again for a school setting, so we want to make sure that all of the things are very contained. So you can replay it in a short period of time. What needs to be done still and in what time frame? And what are the tools used or skills that are needed? What are, I think the intent of the question here is how can this community help with this effort? Yes. So this is a great question. And the thing about it is I'm actually unsure what, what is actually needed. And so this is me trying to like ask you all for your beautiful brains and your intelligence of like, where, where could this be placed? How could this be contained? How could we actually bring this to more people? Because that seems like what you all are experienced in doing, actually working within the market sector and building technology for people and building things while your product is live. Academia doesn't do that. Academia takes a very, a very long time for things to happen. And as a, as a game designer, um, who's actually given the luxury of working in an academic environment where you can take time to build your game, right? This is a newer experience for us to even come out there, uh, come out and figure this out. So part of me feels like, oh, what if we like threw it up on our website and had people log in and track their data? Like, I don't even know if that's a good idea, right? It, does, it sounds great. Great, let's do it. Let's hack at it. Wait, but I think I actually got it to work. No, I'm, I'm so happy about this and all of your work. And in, in the spirit of thinking about like to make it enticing for kids, like for teenagers and stuff, um, is this game fun and is it even supposed to be fun? Oh, like, this is some game theory. I love it. So I do not know if students are having fun. We do not ask them that question. We are looking for, are they, like, what are they saying when they're playing it? What things do they bring up when they bring it back to the conversation? Um, they, from our observations, they continue to go through the experience, right? At no point do they stop, right? So one thing that we can say is that they are engaged. And so one thing that I'm always a big proponent of is that fun means something different for every single one of us in here. I have spent 300 hours in Skyrim picking different flowers so I can build up my alchemy score. I had a blast. Other people are like, why would you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just thought it was amazing. That's my level of fun, right? Other people, it's not like that. So it's hard to kind of determine what would be fun, especially for something like this, right? I don't know if we want them to have fun 
listening to people disclosing their stories, right? But we do want them to know what they should do, right? And we do want them to be engaged because they should actually first listen to their friend and believe what they have to say, right? So, so we kind of take the, the stance of engaged. And so when we're going through our playtest sessions or we're kind of observing in the classroom setting, we're seeing if people look kind of disinterested or they are you know, turned away. But we also make it a point to recognize that this actually also might be triggering for people, right? So we always have trained social workers in the, in the, uh, in the environment because there have actually been quite a few disclosures during this entire experience. So it could also be that, right? So because we don't know, we wanna make sure we have all of our bases covered and make sure that people are safe, right? Because that's the one thing that we wanna make sure. So engaged, yes, fun, probably not. Like I'm a game designer, I, I play this. I'm like, ugh, this, oh, I'm uncomfortable. And I made this game, ah. Oh, it's working. Look at that GIF, look at that animation. Boom. <laughs> this is actually, <laughs> So after designing this game, we have made so many gifts of this, and we just kind of use this as like, a, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's great. But anyway, so this is the um, experience. And so again, it runs like a comic book. I will also stop talking because I know you have other things that you need to do. But long story short, you can click through it. You can read what she has to say, and then eventually you go through the mini game, and you talk to her, and you try and dispel these rape myths. Thank you, Ashlyn, for coming Thank and presenting. You.